Hello everyone. This is Mike Howard and I'm here with Beth Howard. And we're going to do a Bible study in the book of Luke. Today's lesson is in Luke 22 verses 54 through 62 and it's about the denial of Jesus by Peter. Three times he denied the Lord and then the rooster crowed. We all know the story. We've all heard the sermons, but today we're going to take a look at this scripture and try to understand it in terms of what it means for us today as Christians. Mm -hmm. So buckle your pew belts, get out your Bibles, and <laughs> we're going to go ahead and get Ready. started. Ready? Uh -huh. This story actually has three parts. The scripture that we're going to focus on today is part two, which is the actual denial part. But it's not in context until we understand there's a part one and a part three. Part one is that Jesus predicts that Peter is going to deny him three times. He tells him ahead of time, although Peter just can't believe it. Part two is despite Peter's best intentions, he actually does what Jesus said he's gonna do. And he does it exactly the way he says he's going to do it. And then part three, however, <clears throat> It wouldn't be a great story except for part three, and that is Jesus meets with Peter after his resurrection and restores him to his position of leadership in the soon-to-be-formed new church. So we're going to take a look at all three parts and then take a look at how that applies to us. So first part, part one, it's predicted. Jesus warns the disciples that they will all turn away from him when he's arrested. And Peter says, <clears throat> uh, maybe everybody else, but not me. And Jesus tells Peter that he actually is going to deny Jesus three times before dawn. Mm -hmm. And Peter again says, nope, 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 not ever, never, never going to happen, not me. And the other disciples, after Peter does that, they all look at Jesus and said, yeah, yeah, us, we're, we're with Peter. We're not going <laughs> to deny you either. Say, we're, we're, no, that's not going to happen because mm -hmm. they all love Jesus and they had been with him for three years and they just couldn't imagine uh, denying him uh, as the Messiah. That just, it, it, the, the thought was just impossible for them to understand. And we're going to take a look, not in Luke, but in Matthew chapter 26, verses 30 through 35, which is where Jesus explains this. He says, when uh, they had sung a hymn, remember they had just celebrated Passover, the Passover dinner, and they were leaving the upper room and they were headed down into the valley and then back up to the Mount of Olives where they would stop at the Garden of Gethsemane. And as they were walking, Jesus said to them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And that's from Zechariah chapter 17. Uh, but after I've risen, he says, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. In other words, I'll meet you in Galilee and we'll get all of this straightened out at that point. Mm -hmm. Peter replied, even if I all fall away on account of you, <laughs> so this was Peter's answer. Not me. If, and so, so Jesus just got through telling him, you're all gonna fall away on account of me. And, and he says, oh, by the way, the reason I say that is because it is a prophecy in Zechariah. Mm -hmm. and, okay, so we're, we're going to talk about uh, which do you think is more reliable? Uh, Peter's honestly heartfelt belief that he wasn't going to deny Jesus or a prophecy that said all of the disciples were going to deny him. Mm -hmm. Peter was going to fight an uphill battle against prophecy. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered him, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, and when it says declared here, the Greek word is he was very emphatic, and Peter knew how to be emphatic. <laughs> Even if I have to die with you, and remember, Peter's the one that snatched up the sword and cut off right. the, the servant of the high priest's ear. And just a couple hours from when he says this, Jesus, I mean, uh, Peter really believed that he would never deny Jesus. And he, in fact, really risked his whole life with the whole sword thing. And so he says, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Mm. And then all the other disciples who'd been listening to this conversation, they all agreed, no, nope, we're yeah, never yeah, gonna yeah, disown yeah. you. So part two, the night goes on, Jesus goes into the garden and he tells his disciples, he says, okay, I've already told you 
in another one of the gospels, he said that the devil has asked for permission. Remember the book of Job, how, God, uh, how the devil got permission from God to test Job? Well, the devil demanded permission from God to test the faith of the disciples. And he's also going to test the faith of Jesus. He's mm. going to test Jesus. Jesus goes through his own temptation. Remember last week's lesson? Right. Well, at the same point, Jesus just got through telling the disciples that they had been, uh, the, the permission had been given uh, for them to be tested as well, okay? So Jesus instructs the disciples, here's how we're gonna handle this temptation. He says, pray so that you will not fall into the temptation. He says it, he, he tells them to do that three times. And then Jesus goes a little a stones way further and he prays his own prayer. He says, Father, I really don't wanna do this. Take this cup from me. I pray if there's any other way, but, and then the way Jesus did it, he, he, he said, but not my will, but yours be done. What did the disciples do while Jesus is doing that? They were asleep. Instead of praying, they slept through it. So Jesus warns them when he wakes them up, he says, remember the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he kind of says that you gotta believe to all of the disciples, understanding that they're all gonna flee. The spirit, that, that Jesus, uh, Peter's spirit was, I really, really don't think I could ever deny you. That's really what he felt in his heart of hearts. But his flesh told a different story when the time came. The flesh is going to be weak. So let's get to that part of the story, part two, the denial. Luke chapter 22, verses 54 through 62. Then they seized Jesus and they led him away. This is after Judas betrayed him, led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. So what did the, the house of the chief priest, high priest look like? It wasn't a house, it was a palace, it was a complex. They, these priests were making out like bandits. They were mm. taking a cut from every lamb that got sacrificed, every dove that got sold, the money changers in the temple, the ones that Jesus drove out, that was the profit center for the high priests and the, the, the chief priests and the other priests. And they were living mm. like kings. Now, in terms of where this uh, event took place, this is a, a replication that the archaeologists came up with. These are entrances to the chief priest's house, and, and Peter come, is come, going to come in through one of these entrances. And here is a courtyard, and over here, I think, is another courtyard. And you can see the fire pit there where they had the fire and that everybody warmed themselves. So it was a palace. It was a complex of homes where not only Annas, the previous chief, chief priest, lived, but his son-in-law, Caiaphas, uh, lived as well. And, and Annas had five sons, and they all kind of rotated on annual basis through the chief priest's office. So they all probably lived in this same family complex of the house of the chief, palace of the high priest. So that's where Jesus was taken to uh, be confronted by the chief priest. It says, when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, because uh, I think John says it was cold, a uh, courtyard and had sat down, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw Peter seated there in the firelight. She looked at, <laughs> closely at him and said, and this servant girl probably, since she says this, she must have been with the crowd that went to arrest Jesus. She looks closely at Peter and says, you look awfully familiar. He says, this man was with him. But Peter denied it. Woman, well, I, mean, I don't know him, he said. A little later, somebody else saw him and said, you are one of them. And if you go to the Gospel of John, you find out that this was actually a cousin of the guy whose ear was cut off. Who Ooh. said So he was right there. I mean, he's, I'm sure he's talked to his cousin since Jesus rehealed his ear, but he also knew that Peter was the one that whacked his ear off. So, and then you were one of them. And man, I am not, Peter replied. And about an hour later, another one asserted, sure, certainly this man was with him because his dialect is Galilean and all the disciples were from Galilee. So Peter's response there was, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And in John, he says he called down curses on himself and made promises that it was not, he did not know Jesus. And he says, he says, if I am lying to you, then I would be cursed by God. Was he actually made that kind of commitment? Boy, not only did he deny Jesus, but he made it really difficult. He says, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. Now, we don't know what time of night this was. We know that the dinner lasted way into the night. We know that Jesus prayed for a while. We know he was arrested then and then brought in for these. It was still dark. Uh, roosters typically crow 
at uh, just before dawn. Uh, but if you've ever had a rooster, you know that they'll crow at just about any time, day or night, if they're, if they're jostled. Uh, when I get up in the morning, I get up really early in the morning, and if I'm not careful to close my blinds, I wake up a bird that lives in the tree right outside my office, and that bird starts singing. That bird thinks that it's morning. It's morning. But for the intent and purpose of this story, <laughs> let's just go ahead and think that this rooster was on schedule. He saw dawn coming, so it was almost the dawn of the day. But remember, when they sat down at dinner the night before, from a Jewish perspective, that was the beginning of the, of the uh, beginning of the day, Friday. Okay, that was the beginning of Good Friday. That was the beginning of the day that Jesus would wind up being crucified at the end of. So now we're many seven, eight hours, ten or twelve hours into this day. Verse 61, the Lord turned, so Jesus apparently was walking past the place where Peter was at this point. They were moving Jesus from one, uh, one office to another office, trying to accuse him and get in, getting information that they can use to uh, have him killed. And so apparently Jesus was walking right past Peter when this happened. The Lord turned, looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And Peter went outside and he wept bitterly. And the word wept bitterly means he's, he just wailed out loud because he knew that he had failed to do what he wanted to do and he had done exactly what Jesus had prophesied that he would do. But the story thankfully does not end there for Peter. Mm. There's a third part to the story and that's where Jesus restores Peter to his position of leadership in the new church that's about to start. Jesus told the disciples that they're gonna regroup back in Galilee after the resurrection. And if you go to John 21, verse starting in verse 10, you see that Jesus says to them, he appears while they're out fishing. He says, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. Come on, let's have breakfast. Ah, that's cool. I like that. After they ate the breakfast, when they'd finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And I don't know what these meant. Uh, it could have been the other disciples. Uh, it could have been the, his friends. Uh, we don't know exactly, but do you mm -hmm. love me more than these? And he says, yes, Lord. He says, you know that I love you most. And Jesus said, then I want you to feed my lambs. Verse 16, again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And we can go into the Greek and understand the difference between the love words that he said here. But Luke, I don't think Luke is really making a huge point out of that, that he's, Jesus is basically probing Peter, knowing that Peter knows that G, he loves Jesus. I mean, there, Peter's faith did not fail. Peter as a person had a failure, but his faith in Jesus did not fail. Yes, Lord, you know, I love you. And Jesus said, then take care of my sheep. The third time he said to Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt. Uh, he had his feelings hurt because Jesus asked him for a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. And then Jesus tells Peter, he says, truly, I'm telling you that when you were younger. So he prophesied to Peter, that he was going to deny him three times. And now he's about to give another prophecy to Peter. He says, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went out where, where you wanted to go. But when you're old, you're gonna stretch out your hands and somebody else is going to dress mm -hmm. you and lead you and lead you where you do not wanna go. And John says this, he says, Jesus said to this to indicate uh, the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then Jesus' last words to Peter in this, conversation where uh, Peter, follow me. Mm. Just follow me. That's really the whole point of this is just follow mm. me. So what just happened? So let's take a step back because the first thing you got to ask yourself is this is a story. If you, if you were going to write the story about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, if I was gonna write it, I would want it to be purely and completely focused on Jesus. I would not want any other characters on the stage. Do you know what I'm saying? This is the most important event 
that will ever and has ever happened in the history of the world. That is God's son is about to die as a sacrifice for us. I would have, I would have eliminated every other detail. I would have told that and only that story. I would not have intertwined it with any other information. And yet in all four gospels, the story of Peter's denial is inextricably woven into this part of mm -hmm. the crucifixion story. Mm -hmm. So the first point I would make is there's something about this story. Mm -hmm. There's something here that's crucial to the church. Mm -hmm. There's something here that's absolutely imperative that we understand. So let's see if we can grab hold to it. If it wasn't that important, it wouldn't be in all four Gospels. If it wasn't that important, it wouldn't be woven into this story that's the most important story that's ever been told. Well, Satan tested Peter, and Peter failed. It's important for us to understand that Peter really believed with his whole heart that he was not going to do this. He would never deny Jesus. But we also see that Peter was confident pretty much in his own ability. Mm. He was saying, because Jesus just got through telling him, Satan has asked to sift all of you. So he says, I'm Peter. I love you. I can handle Satan by myself. No problem. Big mistake. The second thing Peter said without really saying it out loud is, I know what you said. I know you said it was a prophecy, but I'm telling you, I'm never going to deny you. <sighs> Peter, God spoke it. It's going to happen. I don't care how much you want it. I don't care how much you desire it. I don't care how confident you are. If God spoke the prophecy, there is literally nothing that mm -hmm. you as a human being can do to change that. Mm -hmm. So not only was Peter depending on his own will and his own self, he was basically thumbing his nose at the devil, the second most powerful angel, or most, the most powerful angel probably, I think that's what God said, that he'd ever created. And angels are powerful beings. But he also thumbed his nose at God because he denied God's word, his prophecy. In spite, of, in spite of doing all that, in spite of this cataclysmic failure on Peter's part, Jesus had prayed for Peter's faith to not fail. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it did not fail. Now, folks, you don't know how heartwarming it is to know that because Jesus has prayed for our faith, mm -hmm our faith will never fail. Amen. We are gonna fail. We mm -hmm. are gonna fall. We're gonna stumble. We're gonna do stupid stuff. And we're gonna thumb our nose at the Lord and we're gonna thumb our nose at Satan and we're gonna think that we're able to do anything. And that's stupid. Mm -hmm. But the good news is Jesus prayed that our faith yeah. would not fail. That's a promise, and you can grab it. Mm -hmm. So what can we learn from this? Point number one, don't go up against Satan by yourself. We're all going to be tested. All the disciples were tested. Mm -hmm. Paul says everybody is going to be tempted. We're all going to get tested. And the person testing us is Satan or one of Satan's little demons. Don't think that you're going to go up against that test by yourself and do very well. You're not. Put on the full armor of God. Paul makes it really clear that if you're going to do this Christian life, you're going to need a lot of help. And you're going to have to put on a helmet and a belt and a shoes and all kinds of a shield. A lot of stuff you're going to need if you're going to be successful in your tests. Second point, recognize the weakness of your flesh. Even your most heartfelt intentions are going to fall short. 
without the power of God. Remember, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I remain in you, you're going to bear much fruit. But what does he say? Without me. Well, without me, you can do only a little bit or maybe a, a, a little. No, no. no. He's, I, the scriptures in my Bible says, without me, yeah, no, you're not, not going to be able to do anything. That's nothing, right. Nothing's going to happen. And the third thing I would say here, Jesus told the disciples as they went into the garden, pray that you will not fall into temptation. Prayer is absolutely key here. The Lord's Prayer says, lead us not into temptation. This is a big deal. We are protected from a lot of things in life because the Lord is keeping us safe. Prayer is the key to getting God involved in every test that we're involved in. So if we can learn those three things and we can learn three more. Know that a personal failure is not a failure of our faith. Remember what Paul says. He says, nothing can separate us mm. from the love of God. Nothing can. If you are a child of God, if you've given your life over to Jesus as your Lord, if you've made that commitment, you are now an adopted child of God. There is nothing, remember the prodigal son, there is nothing that can be done that will ruin your faith. You may have a crisis of faith. Our younger son talks about it. He had a crisis of faith. We all have crises of faith, but that does not mean that our faith has failed. It just means that we're in a struggle. It's a test. Nothing's going to separate us. Now, this next one's personal to me. After a failure, allow time to heal and for Jesus to restore you. Back when I was young, back when Beverly and I were both young, uh, the Lord made it clear to me that my one of my big, the big task in my life was going to be to take care of Beverly's parents and my parents. All right, and because Beverly was the youngest and I was the oldest, our parents were very different ages, and I knew that taking care of Bev's parents was probably going to come first. And then right after that, it was going to be followed shortly thereafter. We're taking care of, of my mom and dad. And I looked at that and I said, well, that's just not the kind of retirement that I was hoping to get. And so as I proceeded in my career, I became extremely successful and made a lot of money. And I was thinking that this was going to be a better life than taking care of old people. I mean, it's pretty simple to me being rich, uh, sitting out on the beach all the time, not a care in the world. That sounds way more attractive to me than taking care of old folks, especially old folks that sometimes have dementia and ask the same question a thousand times. And, and it just didn't seem like there was much of a comparison with the life that I was trying to get to and the life that God was calling me to. And therefore I wandered off. I just I said, this is the way I would rather go. I'd rather not do what God wants me to do. I did a Jonah thing. And, uh, and then four back surgeries later uh, and a lost job, uh, I figured out that the reason that God was putting me in a job to make a lot of money was so that I could set a money aside and be able to retire early, not to live a golden life, but to live a life of taking care of mom and dad and Bev's mom and dad. And that was what he was preparing me for, not so that I could be rich and enjoy life, the life of Riley, if you ever watched that show. So I need some time to change course, some time for God to really catch up with me and me to catch up with God. And so for 14 years, I did not teach Sunday school because I was letting God speak to me and to heal me. And then about six years ago, God said, okay, now you're you're okay, you're ready to teach. And the same way he told Peter, feed my sheep, he told me it was time to go back to ministry. So still doing, taking care of parents, but that's not a big deal. I mean, it is a big deal. It's just not a hard deal. So that's point number five. Point number six, make sure that your view of the world lines up with scripture. You know, the Bible is pretty clear about what's going to happen in this world. He's pretty clear what, about what's going to happen to people who do not accept the salvation that God has so freely offered. We need to understand that no matter how we would like to picture the world, God has already explained how the world is and how the world will be. And if you're thinking that you're going to live your life for you, 
I got a flash for you. You are a soldier of the cry of the cross. You are <laughs> you are a servant of the high God. You are a brother of Christ. You are a sister of Christ. Okay, so understand that scripture says that this is the way it's going to be and you probably ought to take a note and line yourself up with that so what are some warning signs for us so that we don't fall into this the first warning sign is if you think you're involved in something and it seems to you pretty easy you can usually say to yourself i think i got this one i think i can handle this one by myself that should be a warning for us whenever we think that we can handle stuff by ourselves the second thing is, I, this is a strength of mine. Uh, you know, I'm pretty good at doing this kind of stuff. I don't think I need any godly help, any supernatural help with this. So I think I'm going to uh, be okay in this area. And the third is very similar to that is I would never be tempted in that area. My faith is simply too strong. Uh, we were a member of a church a long, long time ago that after we left, uh, the preacher retired and they went to hire another preacher. And I said, uh, you know, well, what are you guys looking for? Oh, we found this wonderful preacher and he's just amazing. He, he wants to make sure that he doesn't do anything wrong. So he always leaves his door open to his office and he's got a giant window that he put into the wall so that we could all see him when he's in there and so that he won't be tempted to do anything sexually wrong. And I said, wow, that's cool. He recognizes that's an area where he needs help. <laughs> but there was an area that he didn't need help, which was embezzling money from the church that he fell into. And so he was fired because of that. So oh. anytime you think you're strong, you don't count on it. Uh, I know God wants me to do this, but I have a better idea. That's my personal story and maybe your personal story too. So what does God tell us? He says, so be careful. When you think you're standing firm, Peter, you might fall. You're being tempted in the same way all other human beings are. Did you see that? He said, you're being tempted in the way that not just Christians are being tempted. You're being tempted in the way of what? Every human being is being tested, everyone. But as a Christian, you've got a key advantage here in your test, and that is that God is faithful. You are his child. He's not gonna let you be tempted any more than what you can withstand. But when you're tempted, God's gonna give you a way out so that you can stand up under it. Amen. They just got through singing Psalm 118. Look at what it says in verse five. The Lord's with me, I'm not gonna be afraid. The Lord is with me, he is my helper. I look the I look and triumph over my enemies. The Lord is my strength and my salvation. All of those things, the Lord is. Yes. Big deals. So I got a question for all of us. How about those test results? How are we doing in life? And the answer is, if you're depending on the Lord as your helper, you're going to do just fine. Amen. All right, pray with me. Father God, this story was tied right in with your story of going to the cross. And I could not understand why that would be. But now I understand. Peter was going to be the leader of your church. And he was going to take the church throughout Judea and throughout Samaria. And then all the other apostles and then leaders that came later. And oh, by the way, now it's us, it's us, we're the ones, we're the ones that are going to be involved in the testing because Satan is still testing. So Father, just the way you prayed that the faith would not fail for your apostles, you prayed that our faith would not fail. Father, we depend on that. We depend on your strength. Your strength is made perfect, not in our strength, but in our very weakness. Yes. So Father, we count on you to get us through every single test. Amen. You know, your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Mm. Father, we're in this not alone, mm. but with you because you are our Lord, you are our Savior, mm. and we depend on you. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, things are getting back to normal. Look forward to seeing you soon, I hope. And, and until then, know that Beverly and I love you. Yes.
All right. Amen. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. See you next week. Bye.